This is an Acer Nitro 5 from 2018, and this video is part of my series on seeing how old machines handle these days. This is, if my memory serves me right, Acer's first all AMD laptop, sporting a Ryzen 5 2500U with 8GB of RAM and an RX 560 with 4GB of VRAM, plus a 128GB M.2 SSD and a 1TB hard drive. Don't be fooled by the two in the CPU name though. This is actually a first gen Ryzen part. It's Zen, Zen 1 if you will. Not Zen Plus, Zen 1. That means that this thing isn't exactly a powerhouse. Plus being a USQ chip means that it's ultra low power. It's just a 15 watt chip, which compared to modern Intel chips that can suck back 100 plus watts in a laptop form factor, well this is nothing. As you might expect, that means that CPU performance is, well, pretty naff. Cinebench shows this as having notably worse performance than the much, much older i7-4700MQ in the Chill Blast machine at 2400 points versus 3000. And of course, it absolutely pales in comparison to a modern chip, with over a factor of 10 more performance. Single-threaded is actually a fair bit worse too, getting dangerously close to the 740QM's 411 points in the ancient ASUS G53J. Blender has the BMW scene within 2 minutes of the 4700MQ, but the Gooseberry scene is a lot closer to the 740QM, taking just shy of 2 whole hours to render one frame. For context, the 3980HX in the Strix Scar 16 took under 8.5 minutes. What progress! The most surprising thing for me though was the power figures. This little thing sucked back 6 watts. Ok, there is still a bit of context that you need there. The way Hardware Info reports the power for this chip means that it's only the core power itself. The rest of the chip, or the chip as a whole, drew 12 watts, give or take, at peak, but considering the performance, that's actually really impressive. For gaming though, the RX 560 is actually still pretty capable. The bottlenecks are definitely elsewhere here. In CS2 at 1080p on low settings, I got a pretty poor 48 FPS average and 30.5 FPS in the 1% lows. Compared to the Chill Blast machine with the 765M, this is poor, as that netted 57.6 FPS average. And of course, compared to our modern machine, well, it isn't far off a full power of 10 less performance. I still think that this performance is limited by the 8GB of RAM and the hard drive as well as the lower TDP CPU. Siege is actually a much better experience, netting 100 FPS average compared to just 58.9 FPS on the Chill Blast machine and a much better 1% low figure of 77 FPS versus 44. It's still pretty naff compared to the modern machine on medium settings actually, but still. And actually the same can be said for Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which was actually pretty playable at 49 FPS average compared to just 20 and 17 on the older machines. It's only CS2 that had a significant bottleneck, and that's something that I tested and retested, including doing Windows and BIOS updates too, but nothing helped. Part of that experience though is 100% down to the hard drive. Even the loading time to load the map in was just laughably long. Here, I'll play this in real time while I explain what's going on here. See, the two older machines are old enough that they came with hard drives, and only hard drives. For the G53J, an SSD was a pipe dream, and while the Chill Blast machine does actually have mSATA slots, think of them as the precursor to M.2, it was never populated, as mSATA drives weren't exactly common, nor all that cheap. This Nitro 5, on the other hand, was born right in the dual drive era, where companies knew they had to provide an SSD as the boot drive, but didn't want to splash out on a usable size drive, so they'd opt for basically as small as they could, in this case 128GB, and then they would include a hard disk drive for all your mass storage needs. In theory, that's the best of both worlds, right? Well, sort of, but not really. See, because the two older machines didn't have an SSD at all, when they got too slow, their owner replaced the hard drives outright. 
but because this one does have an SSD, albeit a tiny one, I've never seen the need to swap out the hard drive or replace the SSD with a bigger one. You certainly could, and if you were given this machine as a hand-me-down or something, I think that would be one of the two things that you would have to do to make it usable. But if you were considering upgrading from this, or just upgrading this machine itself, well, I think that might be a bit of a harder decision. Right, has the map finished loading yet? No? Jesus, okay, well, I, I can tell you that it took almost three minutes in total just to load the FPS Heaven benchmark, aka Dust 2. That sort of experience carried over to the gameplay too, with stuttering like crazy until every single asset was loaded into RAM. Although that's actually another problem. It only has eight gigabytes of RAM, and even on a low power CPU like this, that just isn't enough. And of course, when it does overflow the RAM, well, there's a good chance that the page file is on the hard drive because that's the only thing that'll have some space. So yeah, this really needs 16 gigabytes. And luckily it's just so dim, so you can pretty easily replace it. Hell, they've even left an access panel for both the RAM and the hard drive, so you don't need to take the entire thing apart to upgrade those. To decide whether upgrading this thing would actually be worth it, we need to look at the rest of the package. The keyboard is exactly what modern Acer laptops are like, which is to say, a touch on the mushy side, but perfectly usable, backlits, and you know, for the first time actually in these videos, the, uh, the, the, the second layer functions actually work. Amazing, I know. The trackpad is fine. It's a little clunky, but it's bigger than some of the older ones, although still on the small side for modern day usage. IO is all right. There's only one type A USB 3 port, but four USB ports in total, including the type C ports, and then HDMI, ethernet, SD card reader, DCN, and a combo headphone jack and microphone jack to round out the IO. Of course, the important one is the display, which on this is a 1080p 60Hz IPS panel, so we're already starting off a pretty, well, meager start. 60Hz isn't exactly ideal for gaming, and even a cursory glance at some high-speed footage of Aperture Grill's Frog Pursuit test shows that with any amount of fast motion, you'll get a blurry, smeary mess. The panel isn't fast enough to finish drawing the frame at 60Hz, and takes up to two frames to clear an image off the screen, which isn't exactly great. You're gonna be struggling to hit those trick shots on this thing for sure. I think realistically with 16 gigs of RAM and either an upgraded M.2 SSD or a replacement SATA SSD for the hard drive, I think this is still a pretty capable gaming machine, at least in those less intensive titles. Anything eSports will play well, and even more intense games uh, can still play reasonably well, at least on low settings. So it's definitely still viable even for gaming. The display is actually probably one of the biggest limiting factors to how good your experience will be. But as I said, for a hand-me-down machine or like super cheap used, this isn't a bad sort of kid's first gaming machine. The only other thing I might know is that, at least on this one, the battery is fully dead, so if I were to unplug this power cord, the thing would shut off, which again isn't ideal, although there is actually more of a chance that you can find a replacement 46 watt hour battery to stick in this thing, as it's still relatively recent in the grand scheme of things, compared to the uh, other machines that I've been checking out. So yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on the, the 2018 Acer Nitro 5. I'd love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of this machine and the especially the super low power CPU and also the storage configuration? Let me know in the comments down below. If you do want to check out more videos like this one, you can check them out on the end cards. Hit the subscribe button for more videos like this one uh, and turn on the bell notification icon. And if you want to check out my own hardware, the open source response time tool and open source latency testing tool, those are linked in the description as well. Otherwise, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, we'll see you all in the next video.